offshore wind, solar. Dominion Energy is a leader in the clean energy transition. We're dedicated to providing reliable, affordable, safe, and clean energy as we support and invest in our communities in 16 states. Dominion Energy is building a clean energy future. Actions speak louder. Welcome to Action Speak Louder, shining a light on Dominion Energy's projects and community support. I'm Peggy Fox. You know, Dominion Energy is building the country's largest offshore wind project and now has the third largest solar portfolio among utilities across the nation. We're focused on reducing emissions as we build a clean energy future and work to protect our environment. We've also provided millions of dollars from the Dominion Energy Charitable Foundation to environmental causes. And one of the many organizations to receive a recent grant is the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust. The organization has been working to protect nature across the Northern Virginia region for the past 25 years. So far, NVTCT has protected 8,000 acres. So let's find out more. I'd like to introduce Daniel Salzberg who is with the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust. Thanks so much for coming in, I appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be here. So how do you protect land? Yeah, so our primary uh, method is, is through either a, what are called conservation easements mm -hmm. or through uh, land donations or, or purchases of land on some occasions. And when, when there's this conservation easement, is it protected forever from development? Absolutely, yeah. So these conservation easements are a tool we use to, to keep the land protected. You know, the property may be sold or moved on through the future, but, but it maintains the protections over time. That's fantastic. Tell me about, um, it's not just land, but it can also be uh, wetlands and, and different water sources, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So we uh, work very hard to protect both land and water throughout Northern Virginia and the water we we drink is, is that's so important and we may take for granted yeah. but the land is serves and the banks of the land serves as a filter of pollution and we've recently formed a partnership with the water utility fairfax water to help identify and, and protect really the most valuable sources of water for for clean drinking water oh, that's fantastic and of course a lot of wetlands are home to many many species yes. so by protecting their habitat you protect many many species right absolutely yeah the, they maintain species habitat and mm -hmm. and other key ecological features that that wetlands provide mm -hmm. it's really exciting um, and how about um, if a property owner has a piece of land that they would like to see protected and never developed, how would they go about uh, looking into this? Yeah, so we protect all kinds of properties from as small as a quarter of an acre, perhaps, in, in Arlington and our more, ur more urban, excuse me, mm -hmm. places to mm -hmm. many hundreds of acres in our more rural areas. Um, and so if you or your, someone you know has a special place in your community, we'd love, for, we'd love to hear from you and feel free to get in touch. The best way to do that is, is really to look on our website at www.nvct.org. Excellent. Well, Daniel, we do have a short video that really shows uh, what the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust does. So take a look. You can fall in love with land as quick and as deeply as you can fall in love with a person. And I fell in love with this place. Thank you for letting us use your park. Everyone really likes it. We love to run around and play from Fiona, Bridget, and Brady. <laughs> well, it's very sweet. We were touched. It's important that people who live close to a city not see nothing but concrete buildings their whole day, that they, they have an opportunity to spend time with nature and it's important for their kids to have a place to walk. <laughs> Who won? Who won? Oh. Being in the outdoors is really important to me. I think in the D.C. area we live fast-paced lives and I think being able to get out of that, being able to recenter yourself is really important. Tell me which one is your favorite one. And it's really important to me to pass that on to my kid. 
down. Oh, that one. Right. Uh, uh, I, I always... It's a really special bond that you form with your family, with your friends, when you're in an outdoor environment like that. Uh, I want to pick... Yeah, that one, that one. Okay. I think it really does strengthen your love of the outdoors and, and seeing that there are things bigger than yourself. So it was in uh, 1993 that I st stumbled upon the land trust concept and started the process of getting the park authority to agree to help finance the initial creation of the trust. It wasn't long before we recognized that it wasn't just the park authority that needed to preserve land for the future, it was land in general. We expanded our operations over time into Loudoun County, Prince William County, Alexandria, Arlington, Stafford County, and beyond. Over the last several decades, we've protected over 7,000 acres of farms, wetlands, forests, and wildlife habitat in Northern Virginia for the betterment of our community and for the future that our, our kids are gonna want in these areas. I saw the Potomac and the land around it back in the 1950s when I was a girl, and I thought that's the way it should stay. When we first moved here, we had 56 acres, and uh, she's added to it little by little over the years. And in 2006, we had uh, the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust come over and sit in the living room. The big question was, well, will it be protected forever? So they said, yeah, that's written in there. It rides with the deed. So forever sounded pretty good to us. With development, with climate change, with other stressors on the landscape, it's important to know that we will have these parks and open spaces for all time. So you have had some big successes uh, with the NDCT. I keep saying it wrong, NDCT. <laughs> uh, talk about some of the huge successes that you've had that you're just, you know, it's been really um, transformative. I know one is the um, down in the um, Stafford area, right? Or several sure, are down yeah, in the Stafford several area. In the Several in the Stafford area, we, um, as one of our early properties that we protected, actually protected a, a great blue heron rookery, which is the second largest in the mid-Atlantic. And recently we were able to expand that area adjacent to that original acreage by about more than 100 new acres. And, um, and that, so that has been a major success. And that's, that's um, down uh, right off the Potomac River and very close to Crow's Nest? Yes, not too far, and along the Crow's Nest Peninsula, mm -hmm. um, which is about 3,000 acres in total that has been uh, preserved. We were a major, major partner in that collaboration along with Stafford County mm -hmm. and, and, and the state of Virginia to make that happen. That's fantastic. And also, isn't the, um, so that's the Potomac Creek Heronry, Rookery. Heronry, rookery, is it the same Similar, thing? Similar, yeah. Yep. It's where herons go and have their babies. <laughs> exactly. It's where they nesting have their nests. Si <laughs> correct. Nesting site for the herons, yep. We love to see blue herons. They're all blue herons, a different kind of herons, or all uh, the blue herons? Great blue herons, yeah. Great blue herons. Mm -hmm. um, just, um, uh, they're prolific around here, but due to the fact they have lots of habitat. Yes. Or um, am I right? Are they prolific? Well, they have been historically. Unfortunately, in some cases, habitat loss and, mm. and degradation through overdevelopment and, and climate change threatens um, species like like right. great blue herons, but we're we're trying to do our part to maintain the most important habitat for them to survive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. And um, Akakink Bottoms is in that general area too, right? Yeah, along uh, Akakink Creek, uh, okay. we were able to protect about 50 additional acres um, to add to the Crow's Nest uh, Natural Area Preserve recently as well. Let's talk about River Farm uh, because I know you guys had a part in helping to save that too. Yeah. Yeah, we um, recently were able to work with a, a faction of the American Horticultural Society who, mm -hmm. who owns a property along the Potomac River that was one of uh, a piece of George Washington's original estate um, and, and worked with that, 
that group of the American Horticultural Society to see that that land would be conserved. Yeah, I remember when the news came out. I have been to a wedding there before. It's, it's quite a popular location right along the river, this beautiful historic home. And then when news broke uh, a few years ago that it was going to be for sale, there was alarm bells going off and there people were very upset by that. So it's wonderful to see that and the CT was able to step in and, and stop it for now. Yeah, yeah, for now, we, and we, we you know, partnered with a number of other great organizations mm -hmm. and, and government entities to, to make that happen, so. What other, what projects are going on now? Yeah, so we have a, uh, a number of different exciting projects going on. Um, there are certain cases where if we really have a valuable piece of land that we have our eye on, we, we may start a fundraising campaign even to make that happen. So one that stands out right now is uh, a project along Akatink Creek, which is in Fairfax County. And um, it protects waterways, which, which we discussed are very mm -hmm. important, a, a waterway there. And it also has a trail um, that we hope to protect that is open for bikers and, and hikers. Um, and we really want to emphasize public access moving forward as an organization mm -hmm. um, and the ability uh, for all Northern Virginians to have a chance to to really get out there on the land. You know, it, it improves the quality of life for everyone to be able to have access to natural areas and trails. I grew up in Springfield, so I'm very familiar with Agatine Creek. Uh -huh. You know, and it's a, a really wonderful uh, place and you can go along, go hike through there. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you all are, are trying to save the areas there. Um, anything else you'd like to mention? Um, just what we sort of noted before that we'd love to hear from anyone who, who may be interested in protecting their land. Um, uh, you know, there's no no parcel that we wouldn't at least you know consider and have an open dialogue with. Um, so we'd so we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Daniel Salzberg, the land stewardship specialist and grants coordinator for NVCT. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, look. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk more about how Dominion Energy is helping the environment, and we're going to look at a species of fish. In fact, one of the most endangered fish in the world, so stay tuned for that. Come on, let's build and draw and care. See, we can touch and taste and share. Your reward for taking care of them is to get to eat them. Come on, we can find all these gifts and more. It's our nature, explore. Growing bodies and minds grow better when they connect with nature every day. Help the children in your life get out and grow. Visit NatureExplorer at ArborDay.org. Welcome back to Action Speak Louder. We are highlighting organizations that protect the environment. In this case, Friends of Sturgeon out of Lovettsville, Virginia. They're desperately trying to save these amazing gentle giant fish. Sturgeons are the most endangered, one of the most endangered species kind of species group on the earth and this gentle giant they've been around since the age of the dinosaurs but they're now on the brink of extinction due to overfishing a flourishing illegal caviar trade and habitat loss atlantic sturgeon were once found in great abundance but their populations have declined greatly today all five u.s atlantic sturgeons are listed as endangered or threatened under the endangered species act that's just a few facts, but uh, now we're going to talk to Dr. Jason Kahn, who helped, start, who helped start Friends of Sturgeon. I did, yes. I said, I should let yep. you talk about Sturgeon. Tell me why, yep. why did you feel the need to start Friends of Sturgeon? Well, so it's, uh, we, we realized, I guess, after a number of newspaper articles came out and people had found these large dead sturgeon on the beaches, and the newspapers always referred to them as some sort of a sea monster. Oh. And it was as if nobody had ever seen them before, and, and quite likely they hadn't, right? They, they live at the bottom of the water. The, the water is usually murky, so nobody really ever encounters them. Um, but they're a gigantic fish. Well, so, and there's a picture of one of them. Yeah. They're huge. What kind of sturgeon is that so in the picture? that's an Atlantic sturgeon. Okay. Um, and there's actually, there's nine in North America. Nine, nine in North species. America. Um, and almost all of them are listed under the Endangered Species Act, uh, lake sturgeon or not. But and so the reason they're endangered is because people like to eat caviar, they're, uh, the roe. Among other reasons, yeah. Uh, once the, so initially, yes, we, we overfished them, the populations crashed. Um, following that, though, they, there was still a fishery, but it wasn't really lucrative because there weren't very many fish out there. Mm. So then they ended up being subjected to bycatch. Now as shipping increases, there's Wait, what's some, bycatch? Uh, where other people fish? fishing for other animals okay. would encounter them. So. Um, 
yeah, they they still they still have higher than normal mortality rates, mm. and they they live quite a long time. So so this species is an Atlantic sturgeon. They live for about sixty years. Wow. Um, white sturgeon and lake sturgeon live even longer, over a hundred years. Mm. So some of these species take a long time to reach reproductive maturity. So it might take 20, 40, 60 years to build back a population. We have multiple generations that are reproducing. So it's easy to, it's easy when you start overfishing them for them to decline. Exactly, yep. And especially if you're targeting the adults, then it takes a long time for those young ones to reach the adult phase, so. It's so sad. It's, yeah. it's so, and we've lost, I mean, some of them are gone. Some uh, sturgeons around the world are already gone. Yes. It, you told me there were certain areas where they used to flourish and they're just, they're, they're already gone. They're, yes, they're trying to reintroduce them in some parts of the world. Okay. Um, and in other places, uh, like in China with Three Gorges Dam, they may well be on the way to extinction uh -huh. because there used to be a population, they put the dam up and now they can't access their historic spawning grounds. So I found out about your organization because you asked for a grant and we gave you a grant. Yep. Tell me what that money's gonna do or has done. Yeah, so we, we bought two uh, acoustic telemetry receivers and so we put those out in the Chesapeake Bay so we can monitor where the sturgeon are using habitat out there. And, and we really, so, so Friends of Sturgeon was started for two different reasons. We, we wanted to have a, a way to, to support research of researchers that are out there doing the work and we also wanted to be able to, to talk to general people in the general public and let them know you know this species exists it's really cool and it they've been around for 85 to 200 million years their ancestors so they're they're really really old um so we wanted to, to just let people know like this species is out there and and we want to try to help save them so by putting these out in the chesapeake bay we're trying to see exactly what habitats are being used and and how we can sort of focus our future efforts in protecting the species. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. And how did it, you've gotten all the, um, all of the apparatus on there and you're, can yeah. you see where they are? So we've been monitoring, um, and so with acoustic telemetry, basically we, we put tags in fish. And so we got funding from different organizations mm -hmm. to do this work over about the last decade or so. And, and a bunch of other people up and down the coast are doing similar work on sturgeon. And, and when I say a bunch, like 40 of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's a relatively small group of sturgeon people that are interested in sturgeon. But we put out these telemetry tags and they send out this ping and the ping can be heard by these receivers if the fish is close enough. And so that's what the, these two receivers are, are, are put into places where we would expect sturgeon to be. So they're, they're in sort of deep water channels um, where the flow is not, not overwhelming. So you, they would just be able to hang out there and. Um, in, in typical sturgeon habitat, I guess you would call it. So we've had, we've had good luck. We've detected a lot of different fish. We've actually, in addition to sturgeon, detected a bunch of other fish that we were able to give other researchers data on. Oh, that is fascinating. Um, so how many, in our area around the Chesapeake Bay and um, the Potomac River, do any sturgeons live in the Potomac? Uh, they used to in pretty good numbers. Uh, we don't know for sure if there's still a reproductive population. Um, we certainly, there's commercial fishermen that are out there that fish. Uh, they fish down low enough in the river where it could be not necessarily re sturgeon coming back to reproduce. They could just be sturgeon coming in to feed. Um, we do see some caught every year by accident in pound nets or gill nets. So possibly there, there may be a population in the, in the Potomac. Mm -hmm. But mostly uh, the Chesapeake Bay. So, well, in the Chesapeake, in the there's a, a big population in the James River, uh, and then there's for sure a population in the York River and the Nanticoke River on the eastern shore. Um, we suspect there may be some reproduction in the Rappahannock, uh, possibly the Susquehanna, possibly the Potomac. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've had a few telemetry detections in the Pocomoak River and places like that. Uh, so there's, there's still a lot of work mm -hmm. to be done. And what do you do when you get a detection? Um, so if it seems promising and it's the right time of year, maybe in the right location, we might go and set some nets or we might put more receivers out to try to get a better idea of what fish are using that habitat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, uh, it can be used for any mm -hmm. number of different studies. So if right. we wanted to learn uh, what the survival rates are for these fish, then we would use, we, we do, it's basically a mark recapture study where the recapture is a detection and you can see how frequently mm -hmm. you, you detect that fish. And if you start to go a long period of time without seeing that tag, then it probably didn't make mm -hmm. it. 
You sent me a couple of little uh, snippets of video, and I want you to talk about what they are. One is uh, when you're catching it. Some people mm -hmm. might want well, you have to catch it in order to put the telemetry on it. Right. Yeah. And so when you're working, so that was a the video is uh, adult. So it, this is a large female fish that we were catching at the time. But when we're catching the adults, they're they're huge and they're moving up rivers. There's a limited amount of mm -hmm. different ways that you can try to catch a big fish like that. Um, within a river system, one of the most common is a gill net. And so a gill net is just, it's a, a mesh net that has webbing that's about the same size of the fish. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, yeah. and the fish swims into it and just gets entangled, and then we're right there on the side of the river watching the nets, and as soon as you see the net move, you run out there and you grab the fish out of and it. And this is what you're doing here in the picture. Yeah, so we're, we're, <laughs> we're basically, we're, we're holding the net at the time, and we're, yeah. we're walking over, just pulling the boat behind it, um, heading over to the fish. Right. And then once we get there, we usually have a, a large dip net and we put the net in front mm -hmm. of the fish and we, we tie a rope to the tail and we get the fish out of the net and we bring it aboard and we, we do our work up. Is it dangerous at all for the fish to be captured like that? Uh, it can be, yeah. So we consider that. Um, that's why we sit on the, on the river bank and we watch. So the, the longer that a fish sits in a gill net, especially if it gets around their gills, the more likely it is going to be a problem. Mm. So that's why we get out there immediately. It's usually in the net for 10 minutes, and we've never had a problem with over 600 fish we've caught. And then you attach. How do you attach the? So we surgically implant the oh, telemetry tag, and, right. and they last for about 10 years. So we can follow this fish up and down the coast. We've seen them as far north as New York and as far south as Florida. And you do that that quickly? Uh, well, it takes about five minutes probably to put a tag in. To surgically implant, and then you have some kind of sutures that you put to cover the? Yep, same as you would use for people. So they just dissolve over time. Wow, um, and, we, and you can do it in five minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, yeah, and there's a, a number of different ways to anesthetize a fish. Uh, we typically use electronarcosis, so it's a, an electrical current that runs through the fish and it actually just sedates them. So. And then you let it go. And as soon as you turn the current off, they're back to normal. Wow, and there they go. I'm sure a lot of people, if they see one, they're scared because they think it's a shark or whatever. They, yeah, they have they, no idea. They do actually look quite a bit like a shark. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they actually now are quite, a, they are quite a bit like a shark. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're actually a bony fish. Mm -hmm. And so they evolved along the lines of fish that have bones, but they've now through evolution actually developed an all cartilaginous skeleton. Mm -hmm. So just like a shark, except for they, they got there in two different ways. But these guys were around, uh, this species has been documented to be, you, there's fossils from before dinosaurs? Ancestors, yeah. Ancestors. Yep. From, yeah, okay. prior to Tyrannosaurus rex. So. Um, what does that tell you about the species? Well, they're I mean, obviously quite a survivor. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's sort of the terrifying thing is genetically they are so unique. So you and I are diploid and most animals are diploid. We have two chromosomes um, or two pairs of chromosomes, but these are polyploid. And so Atlantic sturgeon have 12 pairs of chromosomes. So they, they are very resilient. Um, it's, it's really hard to have any sort of a mutation disrupt the population and what's going on. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you talk about the fact they've survived, this species has evolved since before the dinosaurs, and now we're killing them off, yeah. which is, is terrifying. It's horrible. And that's, we, so when we were discussing exactly how to protect sturgeon, it was more of a discussion of do we do it at more of a community level and, and try, to, try to protect the whole community and, and everything, the whole environment that's out there, mm -hmm. or do we really focus our efforts on sturgeon? And we decided really just to focus on sturgeon because they're sort of the canary in the coal mine. And what do you mean by that? Um, so sturgeon are there, you know, having evolved over such a long period of time and almost that entire length of time was without humans and certainly without that last 150 years of, you know, uh, factories and pollution and things like that. So they're very susceptible to poor water quality. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we see most of our issues is, is they, don't, they don't do very well with bad water quality, low dissolved oxygen, things like that. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of the, the ones that you can look at, and if they're not doing well, then you can trust that almost everything else there is not gonna do well eventually. So very critical to save the sturgeon. I think so, certainly. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on and helping us yeah. learn a little bit about sturgeon and uh, why we need to save them and what you're doing. And uh, hopefully we can continue the partnership with Dominion Energy and help your organization and, and other people can step up as well. We would certainly love that. Yeah, uh, yes, we will certainly talk. I would, I would like that. All right, a little more information on your website, friendsofsturgeon.org. Yes. Yeah, you know, I know you're going to be beefing that up and providing more information as, as uh, 
Yeah, well, we and one of our objectives actually is eventually the, the receivers that you've provided and other people have mm -hmm. provided is to be able to put that data out there so mm -hmm. that everybody can see where these fish are moving and going and coming. Very good. Dr. Jason Kahn, you're a PhD of ecology. I am, yes. And uh, I didn't even mention that, that you work for the, uh, maybe I did, the National uh, Marine Fishers, Fisheries Service, but you're here representing Friends of Sturgeon. Yes. Thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you it. so much for having me. All right, me. look forward to having you back and uh, when we can, you know, have more sturgeon out there. We yeah. won't be afraid of them because they're gentle giants. They, they are. don't bite you, right? You can see they don't have teeth. No teeth. All right, very <laughs> good. Thanks for watching Action Speak Louder. We hope you join us next time to learn more about how Dominion Energy is working toward a sustainable future while supporting our customers and communities. Be safe.